Section 20 of On Benefits. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Benefits by Seneca. Translated by Aubrey Stewart. Book 6, Chapters 23 to 32. Chapter 23. Besides this, the gods act under no external constraint, but their own will is allotted to them for all time. They have established an order, which is not to be changed, and consequently it is impossible that they should appear to be likely to do anything against their will, since they wish to continue doing whatever they cannot cease from doing, and they never regret their original decision. No doubt it is impossible for them to stop short, or to desert to the other side, but it is so for no other reason than that their own force holds them to their purpose. It is from no weakness that they preserve. No, they have no mind to leave the best course, and by this it is fated that they should proceed. When, at the time of the original creation, they arranged the entire universe, they paid attention to us as well as to the rest, and took thought about the human race. And for this reason, we cannot suppose that it is merely for their own pleasure that they move in their orbits and display their work, since we are also a part of that work. We are, therefore, under an obligation to the sun and the moon and the rest of the heavenly host, because although they might rise in order to bestow more important benefits than those which we receive from them, yet they do bestow these upon us as they pass on their way to greater things. Besides this, they assist us of set purpose, and therefore lay us under an obligation, because we do not in their case stumble by chance upon a benefit bestowed by one who knew not what he was doing. But they knew that we should receive from them the advantages which we do, so that though they may have some higher aim, though the result of their movements may be something of greater importance than the preservation of human race, yet from the beginning thought has been directed to our comforts and the scheme of the world has been arranged in a fashion which proves that our interests were neither their least nor last concern. It is our duty to show filial love for our parents, although many of them had no thought of children when they married. Not so with the gods. They cannot but have known what they were doing when they furnished mankind with food and comforts. Those for whose advantage so much was created could not have been created without design nature conceived the idea of us before she formed us and indeed we are no such trifling piece of work as could have fallen from her hands unheeded see how great privileges she has bestowed upon us how far beyond the human race the empire of mankind extends consider how widely she allows us to roam not having restricted us to the land alone but permitted us to traverse every part of herself consider too the audacity of our intellect, the only one which knows of the gods and seeks for them, and how we can raise our mind high above the earth and commune with those divine influences, you will perceive that a man is not a hurriedly put together or an unstudied piece of work. Among her noblest products, nature has none of which she can boast more than men, and assuredly no other which can comprehend her boast. What madness is this to call the gods in question for their bounty? If a man declares that he has received nothing when he is receiving all the while, and from those who will always be giving without ever receiving anything in return, how will he be grateful to those whose kindness cannot be returned without expense? And how great a mistake is it not to be thankful to a giver, because he is good even to him who disowns him, or to use the fact of his bounty being poured upon us in an uninterrupted stream, as an argument to prove that he cannot help bestowing it. Suppose that such men as these say, I do not want it, let him keep it to himself, who asks him for it, and so forth, with all the other speeches of insolent minds. Still, he whose bounty reaches you, although you say that it does not, lays you under an obligation nevertheless. Indeed, perhaps the greatest part of the benefit which he bestows is that he is ready to give even when you are complaining against him. Chapter 24 Do you not see how parents force children during their infancy to undergo what is useful for their health, though the children cry and struggle, 
they swayed them and bind their limbs straight, lest premature liberty should make them grow crooked. Afterwards, instill into them our liberal education, threatening those who are unwilling to learn. And finally, if spirited young men do not conduct themselves frugally, modestly, and respectably, they compel them to do so. Force and harsh measures are used even to youths who have grown up and are their own masters. If they either from fear or from insolence refuse to take what is good for them, thus the greatest benefits that we receive, we receive either without knowing it or against our will from our parents. Chapter 25 Those persons who are ungrateful and repudiate benefits, not because they do not wish to receive them, but in order that they may not be laid under an obligation for them, are like those who fall into the opposite extreme and are over-grateful who pray that some trouble or misfortune may befall their benefactors to give them an opportunity of proving how gratefully they remember the benefit which they have received. It is a question whether they are right and show a truly dutiful feeling. Their state of mind is morbid, like that of frenetic lovers who long for their mistress to be exiled, that they may accompany her when she leaves her country forsaken by all her friends or that she may be poor in order that she may be the more in need of what they give her or who long that she may be ill in order that they may sit by her bad side and who in short out of sheer love form the same wishes as her enemies would wish for her thus the results of hatred and of frenetic love are very nearly the same and these lovers are very like those who hope that their friends may meet with difficulties which they may remove and who thus do a wrong that they may bestow a benefit, whereas it would have been much better for them to do nothing than by crime to gain an opportunity of doing good service. What should we say of a pilot who prayed to the gods for dreadful storms and tempests in order that danger might make his skill more highly esteemed? What of a general who should pray that a vast number of the enemy surround his camp, fill the ditches by a sudden charge, tear down the rampart round his panic-stricken army, and plant its hostile standards at the very gates, in order that he might gain more glory by restoring his broken ranks and shattered fortunes. All such men confer their benefits upon us by odious means, for they beg the gods to harm those whom they mean to help, and wish them to be struck down before they raise them up. It is a cruel feeling, brought about by a disordered sense of gratitude, to wish evil to befall one whom one is bound in honor to secure. Chapter 26 My wish, argues our opponent, does him no harm, because when I wish for the danger, I wish for the rescue at the same time. What you mean by this is not that you do no wrong, but that you do less than if you wish that the danger might befall him without wishing for the rescue. It is wicked to throw a man into the water in order that you may pull him out, to throw him down that you may raise him up, or to shut him up that you may release him. You do not bestow a benefit upon a man by ceasing to wrong him, nor can it ever be a piece of good service to anyone to remove from him a burden which you yourself imposed on him. True, you may cure the hurt which you inflict, but I had rather that you did not hurt me at all. You may gain my gratitude by curing me because I am wounded, but not by wounding me in order that you may cure me. No man likes scars, except as compared with wounds, which he is glad to see thus healed, though he had rather not have received them. It would be cruel to wish such things to befall one from whom you had never received a kindness. How much more cruel it is to wish that they may befall one in whose depth you are. Chapter 27 I pray, replies he, at the same time that I may be able to help him. In the first place, if I stop you short in the middle of your prayer, it shows at once that you are ungrateful. I have not yet heard what you wish to do for him. I have heard what you wish him to suffer. You pray that anxiety and fear, and even worse evil than this, may come upon him. You desire that he may need aid. This is to his disadvantage. You desire that he may need your aid. This is to your advantage. You do not wish to help him, but to be set free from your obligation to him. For, when you are eager to repay your debt in such a way as this, you merely wish to be set free from the debt, not to repay it. 
so the only part of your wish that could be thought honorable proves to be the base and ungrateful feeling of unwillingness to lie under an obligation for what you wish for is not that you may have an opportunity of repaying his kindness but that he may be forced to beg you to do him a kindness you make yourself the superior and you wickedly degrade beneath your feet the man who has done you good service how much better would it be to remain in his debt in an honorable and friendly manner than to seek to discharge the debt by these evil means you would be less to blame if you deny that you had received it for your benefactor would then lose nothing more than he gave you whereas now you wish him to be rendered inferior to you and brought by the loss of his property and social position into a condition below his own benefits do you think yourself grateful just utter your wishes in the hearing of him to whom you wish to do good do you call that a prayer for his welfare which can be divided between his friend and his enemy which if the last part were omitted you would not doubt be pronounced by one who opposed and hated him enemies in war have sometimes wished to capture certain towns in order to spare them or to conquer certain persons in order to pardon them yet these were the wishes of enemies and what was the kindest part of them began by cruelty finally what sort of prayers do you think those can be which he on whose behalf they are made hopes more earnestly than any one else may not be granted in hoping that the gods may injure a man and that you may help him you deal most dishonorably with him and you do not treat the gods themselves fairly for you give them the odious part to play and reserve the generous one for yourself the gods must do him wrong in order that you may do him a service if you were to suborn an informer to accuse a man and afterwards withdrew him if you engaged a man in a lawsuit and afterwards gave it up no one would hesitate to call you a villain what difference does it make whether you attempt to do this by a chicanery or by prayer unless it be that by prayer you raise up more powerful enemies to him than by the other means you cannot say why what harm do i do him your prayer is either futile or harmful indeed it is harmful even though nothing comes out of it you do your friend wrong by wishing him harm you must thank the gods that you do him no harm the fact of your wishing is enough we ought to be just as angry with you as if you had affected it chapter twenty eight if argues our adversary my prayers had any efficacy they would also have been efficacious to save him from danger in the first place i reply the danger into which you wish me to fall is certain the help which i should receive is uncertain or call them both certain it is that which injures me that comes first besides you understand the terms of your wish i shall be tossed by the storm without being sure that i have a heaven of rest at hand think what torture it must have been to me even if i receive your help to have stood in the need of it if i escape safely to have trembled for myself if i be acquitted to have had to plead my cause to escape from fear however great it may be can never be so pleasant as to live in sound unassailable safety pray that you may return my kindness when i need their return but do not pray that i may need them you would have done what you prayed for had it been in your power chapter twenty nine how far more honorable would a prayer of this sort be i pray that he may remain in such a position as that he may always bestow benefits and never need them may he be attended by the means of giving and helping of which he makes such a bountiful use may he never want benefits to bestow or be sorry for any which he has bestowed may his nature fitted as it is for acts of pity goodness and clemency be stimulated and brought out by numbers of grateful persons whom i trust he will find without needing to make trial of their gratitude may he refuse to be reconciled to no one and may no one require to be reconciled to him may fortune be so uniformly continued to favor him so that no one may be able to return his kindness in any way except by feeling grateful to him how far more proper are such prayers as these which do not put you off to some distant opportunity but express your gratitude at once what is there to prevent your returning your benefactor's kindness even while he is in prosperity how many ways are there by which we can repay what we owe to the affluent 
for instance, by honest advice, by constant intercourse, by courteous conversation, pleasing him without flattering him, by listening attentively to any subject which he may wish to discuss, by keeping safe any secret that he may impart to us, and by social intercourse. There is no one so highly placed by fortune as not to want a friend all the more because he wants nothing. Chapter 30 The other is a melancholy opportunity, and one which we ought always to pray may be kept far from us. Must the gods be angry with a man in order that you may prove your gratitude to him? Do you not perceive that you are doing wrong from the very fact that those to whom you are ungrateful fare better? Call up before your mind dungeons, chains, wretchedness, slavery, war, poverty. These are the opportunities for which you pray. If anyone has any dealings with you, it is by means of these that you square your account. Why not rather wish that he to whom you owe most may be powerful and happy? For, as I have just said, what is there to prevent your returning the kindness even of those who enjoy the greatest prosperity, to do which ample and various opportunities will present themselves to you? What, do you not know that a debt can be paid even to a rich man? Nor will I trouble you with any instances of which you may do. Though a man's riches and prosperity may prevent your making him any other repayment, I will show you what the highest in the land stand in need of, what is wanting to those who possess everything. They want a man to speak the truth, to save them from the organized mass of falsehood by which they are beset, which so bewilders them with lies that the habit of hearing only what is pleasant instead of what is true prevents their knowing what truth really is. Do you not see how such persons are driven to ruin by the want of a candor among their friends, whose loyalty has degenerated into slavish obsequiousness? No one, when giving them his advice, tells them what he really thinks, but each vies with the other in flattery, and while the man's friends make it their only object to see who can most pleasantly deceive him, he himself is ignorant of all his real powers, and believing himself to be as great a man as he is told that he is, plunges the state in useless wars, which brings disasters upon it, breaks off a useful and necessary peace, and though a passion of anger which no one checks spills the blood of numbers of people and at the last sheds his own such persons assert what has never been investigated as certain facts consider that to modify their opinion is as dishonorable as to be conquered believe that institutions which are just flickering out of existence will last for ever and thus overturn great states to the destruction of themselves and all who are connected with them living as they do in a fool's paradise resplendent with unreal and short-lived advantages they forget that as soon as they put it out of their power to hear the truth there is no limit to the misfortunes which they may expect chapter thirty one when xerxes declared war against greece all his courtiers encouraged his boastful temper which forgot how unsubstantial his grounds of confidence were one declared that the greeks would not endure to hear the news of the declaration of war and would take to flight at the first rumor of his approach another that with such a vast army greece could not openly be conquered but utterly overwhelmed and that it was rather to be feared than they would find the greek cities empty and abandoned and that the panic flight of the enemy would leave them only vast deserts when no use could be made of their enormous forces another told him that the world was hardly large enough to contain him that the seas were too narrow for his fleets the camps would not take in his armies the plains were not wide enough to deploy his cavalry in and that the sky itself was scarcely large enough to enable all his troops to hurl their darts at once while much boasting of this sort was going on around him raising his already overweening self-confidence to a frenetic pitch demaratus the lacedaemonian alone told him that the disorganized and unwieldy multitude in which he trusted was itself a danger to its chief because it possessed only weight without strength for an army which is too large cannot be governed and one which cannot be governed cannot long exist the lacedaemonians said he will meet you upon the first mountain in greece and will give you a taste of their quality all these thousands of nations of yours will be held in check by three hundred men 
they will stand firm at their posts they will defend the passes entrusted to them with their weapons and block them up with their bodies all asia will not force them to give away few as they are they will stop all this terrible invasion attempted though it be nearly the whole human race though the laws of nature may give way to you and enable you to pass from europe to asia yet you will stop short in a bypath consider what your losses will be afterwards when you have reckoned up the price which you had to pay for the pass of thermopylae when you learn that your march can be stayed you will discover that you may be put to flight the greeks will yield up many parts of their country to you as if they were swept out of them by the first terrible rush of a mountain torrent afterwards they will rise against you from all quarters and will crush you by means of your own strength what people say that your warlike preparations are too great to be contained in the countries which you intend to attack is quite true but this is to our disadvantage greece will conquer you for this very reason that she cannot contain you you cannot make use of the whole your force besides this you will not be able to do what is essential to victory that is to meet the maneuvers of the enemy at once to support your own men if they give way or to confirm and strengthen them when their ranks are wavering long before you know it you will be defeated moreover you should not think that because your army is large that its own chief does not know its numbers it is therefore irresistible there is nothing so great that it cannot perish nay without any other cause its own excessive size may prove its ruin what demaratus predicted came to pass he whose power gods and men obeyed and who swept away all that opposed him was bidden to hold by three hundred men and the persians defeated in every part of greece learned how great a difference there is between a mob and an army thus it came to pass that xerxes who suffered more from the shame of his failure than from the losses which he sustained thanked Demaratus for having been the only man who told him the truth and permitted him to ask what boon he pleased he asked to be allowed to drive a chariot into sardis the largest city in asia wearing a tiara erect upon his head a privilege which was enjoyed by kings alone he deserved his reward before he asked for it but how wretched must the nation have been in which there was no one who would speak the truth to the king except one man who did not speak it to himself chapter thirty two the late emperor augustus banished his daughter whose conduct went beyond the shame of ordinary immodesty and made public the scandals of the imperial house led away by his passion he divulged all these crimes which as emperor he ought to have kept secret with as much care as he punished them because the shame of some deeds asperses even him who avenges them afterwards when by lapse of time shame took the place of anger in his mind he lamented that he had not kept silence about matters which he had not learned until it was disgraceful to speak of them and often used to exclaim none of these things would have happened to me if either agrippa or maecenas had lived so hard was it for the master of so many thousands of men to repair the loss of two when his legions were slaughtered new ones were at once enrolled when his fleet were wrecked within a few days another was afloat when the public buildings were consumed by fire finer ones arose in their steed but the places of agrippa and maecenas remained unfilled throughout his life what am i to imagine that there were not any men like these who could take their place or that it was the fault of augustus himself who preferred mooring for them to seeking for their likes we have no reason for supposing that it was the habit of agrippa or maecenas to speak the truth to him indeed if they had lived they would have been as great dissemblers as the rest it is one of the habits of the kings to insult their present servants by praising those whom they have lost and to attribute the virtue of truthful speaking to those from whom there is no further risk of hearing it end of section twenty recording by anna naumoska